So I want to introduce myself. My name is Murray Frank. I am uh, what they call a building science consultant, <coughs> which is in interesting in that building science was not a recognized discipline in the professions until after I started doing this for some time. Uh, if I want to back this up a little bit further, my then girlfriend, now wife, and I lived on John Durant's property way up at the very top of the hill over there for about a year. I went to school with Peter MacArthur at UBC. I knew uh, Denise and Chris. I worked at Litton Lumber and pulled on the green chain, I think in about 1987 for, for a good hot summer. And um, Litton's always had a special little place in my heart. And it was after I left here, I actually left here to go to work with a consulting engineering group out of Toronto who did building science evaluations and uh, realized I was too much of a lone wolf, so I incorporated my own practice in September of 1990 and have practiced continuously since that time in building science, which is uh, to do with everything that impacts a building. So it's geotechnical, energy, rainwater penetration, roofing, comfort, sound, fire resistance. It's, uh, the idea is it's the ability to model and predict performance and the interaction between all those things and how they can affect each other so that we can explore new and wonderful technologies and changes in priorities for housing and, and commercial buildings and industrial and institutional and have a reasonable idea of what that performance is going to be. So it's a predictive science. And it also gets used a lot in forensics. So over the years, I have been an expert witness in the Supreme Court and uh, of both BC and in Canada. I was the guy in 1992 that did a presentation called Water Got In, Made Things Bad. And in that presentation, I coined the term leaky condo. Oh, and I brought a sample <laughs> of of the rain screen wall that you hear a fair amount of, the capillary break behind the cloud, which is now mandatory in all high moisture index regions in North America, soon to be all houses and homes and buildings built in, in North America. Uh, so I brought that in. I put it under blue tarpon, tarpaulin because all the buildings in Vancouver in 1991 and 1992 were covered in blue tarpaulins because they were all melting in the rain. Um, I got in a lot of trouble for that presentation. I wasn't a very popular guy. And, uh, Anyway, it turned out that I was right in the fullness of time, and um, that was probably a good thing, but uh, it also really cemented for me just how important it is that, uh, that we have this capability to understand and predict performance in buildings, um, because we don't do it the same way we used to do it 500, 1,000, or 10,000 years ago. Uh, in those days, everything happened by trial through time. Like you built stuff, and the things that worked, you kept repeating. And the things that didn't work, you just knew better than to do it again. But the evolution of housing, think about it, like the grand old Tudor homes in old Europe. Uh, that was one type of construction with wattle and knob between heavy timber until they ran out of oak trees in Europe. But for 800, 900 years, that's how you built houses. Around here, name two houses that are built the same way in North America. There's always some other combination of permutation oriented different on the, on the building site or, or, or perhaps in a different climate zone or perhaps with other risk factors like fire or, you know, I've, I've lived here. You know, we dove for the creek because that was nature's air conditioner because we didn't have air conditioning in 99% of the houses that were around here in trailers. And if those trees were over top of that river, it brought cold air down with it because it was evaporating. It was an old fashioned swamp cooler just to be around those creeks. And we would picnic in there, me and my wife, and. And that's how we would get through those dog days, because you know, Litton, when it's really hot, what happens to the wind here? <coughs> Just stops. Right? And I pulled lumber on the green chain at Litton. I was on the long boards right up by the shack, galvanized metal. So the sun would beat and reflect on me all day and cook me from the other side. So I get that you need to appreciate what you're building into, and there are no two homes that are going to be the same. And I also um, fully admit that the government has decided that it's going to prioritize a fair amount of change in what we expect from our homes. And that means, uh, obviously, you've heard about new higher energy efficiency requirements that uh, are coming. They actually came into effect on May 1st here. So we're into this thing called step code in BC. The rest of Canada calls it a tier code. The graphic's exactly the same. They didn't even hire a different company, but you know the national people wanted to call it tier code. And we started all of this because in BC, we've been first and foremost. <coughs> Uh, we had the leaky condo, so we pushed for improved envelope performance. We had a government that was, you know, entrenched in this notion of greater energy efficiency, and 
We did major research projects for them in 2010, 2011 on this, and yet we're still just on May 1st, finally building houses with 20% better energy efficiency. Um, but in six years from now, all new homes have to be <coughs> 70, 80% higher energy efficiency than what we built. And that changes the game completely too, because your old furnace was designed to heat in the winter based on not a really highly energy efficient set of windows and insulation and certainly not great air tightness. But now in order to achieve these new minimum legal requirements under the building code, you know, you're going to take an old furnace which might have had four and a half tons of forced air capacity. You might only need <coughs> one ton of air capacity for that exact same shell of a home, form of a home. Uh, and that means that that furnace could be a quarter of the size, 20% of the size of what you used to have and still give you the same comfort. So that's kind of good news because the smaller they get, the cheaper they are. Um, but you know, on the other side, they've also got new technologies that allow us to disengage from gas and you know, don't even have a gas connection here. So this movement towards all electric to disconnect from natural gas works to the advantage for a community like this. And then if you really want to be a nerd about this stuff, yesterday the provincial government issued the public review for the new building code in 2024 that will come into effect next spring here. So we're less than a year away from that code actually hitting. And every new home built in British Columbia beginning next spring is going to require some degree of cooling. You can't cool with a furnace. You gotta cool with a cooling device. So we're gonna see a transition into heat pump technologies. It disconnects you from gas and it works on electricity and one device in the winter works as a furnace. It actually takes the heat that's outside and I'll explain that in a little bit, but go with me for a second. It takes the heat from outside and brings it into your house. And then in the summer, it turns around, works backwards, it takes the heat from inside your house, puts it outside. So the big question is, what do you mean the heat outside in the winter? Minus five degrees, oh, that's not heat. Engineers are little cone heads, right? They don't talk about degrees Celsius. They use the same increments. The degrees are the same, but they use a scale called Kelvin. And zero degrees, Celsius is freezing point of water. Zero degrees Kelvin is absolute zero. That's when all the molecules in the world stop moving. Can't get colder than stopped. So that's the depth. And that's 273 and a bit degrees below the freezing point of water. So when it's minus five degrees C outside, an engineer will tell you that's toasty warm. It's 268 degrees Kelvin outside. So the idea is you stick a refrigerant out there that boils at minus five or minus 10 C and it becomes a vapor and then you bring it in and you condense the vapor back into a liquid and you use this principle of thermodynamics that you can't create or destroy energy. So if you boil something, it takes energy. You have to put it in to break those, those bonds of the molecules to make them more free flying to become a vapor, right? So if you've got to put energy in and you can't create or destroy energy, you're putting energy in by boiling a refrigerant even though it's cold to you and I, it's really hot to the refrigerant. And then that vapor comes in and then you pass it over the air blowing from inside your house and you change the pressure of the refrigerant so that changes its boiling point. And now what it does is it condenses. So that air comes in and it condenses from a vapor back down into a liquid and it goes out and it just goes around in a circle like that. It goes from this vapor to a liquid and it goes from a liquid to a vapor and it comes in. And the only thing you have to do is change the pressure on both sides to change the boiling point. So it goes outside and it grabs that energy and it releases exactly the same amount of BTU or gigajoules or whatever you want to measure your energy by, they're all, it's all just energy, it releases the exact same amount on the other side. And then when you hit the reversing valve, it just turns around. So now it boils inside and condenses outside. So that one unit that's outside, like your air conditioners, it is a heat pump. It's just only working in one direction. An air source heat pump just simply has a reversing valve and it's engineered so it works in both directions. And a lot of people were, hmm, you know, the Okanagan didn't have a great experience with them, but we weren't adding great energy efficiency to the equation. We we're still building them into these nasty, we haven't ostensibly changed the energy performance of houses since mid-1980s here in BC. We went from a two by four wall to a two by six wall in the codes in 1980s, and we put pink stuff in them. That's all we've been doing ever since, right up until May 1st, that was the minimum provision of the building code. So. Yeah, you needed four tons of heating and cooling capacity. In English, you needed really big 
air conditioning units to cool in the summer. You need really big furnaces to get that heat in there because you put a little bit in that we get to use and the rest of it's just flowing out with the airflow, the air leakage in the envelope, and it's flowing out through the insulation. And, and so you got to put in a ton just to get a little bit of goodness out of it. Well, the whole idea behind energy efficiency is you tighten up that envelope so that it's really nice and airtight. And you put really, really highly performing insulation blankets around so that you don't get conductive movement of heat, you don't get convective movement of heat, and then you deal with your windows and put all these neat, uh, you've heard of low E glazing and everything. It's just, it's actually high reflectance coatings that they put on there, but it reflects infrared light, and that's where heat moves when it's radiating. It moves in the frequency. We can't see it, it's below visible red light, but that frequency, if you believe in light, you believe in radiant movement of heat energy. So it moves three ways, so you gotta control its radiant movement, and that's why the windows, because light goes through it, so does heat. So you put those high reflectance coatings on, but that sounds like reflective mirror glasses from the 1970s, like chips, it doesn't sell very well. So the window industry went to the engineers and said, we can't sell high reflectance, people don't want that. They don't want a mirror glass. So the engineers said, well, you're only reflecting the infrared. It doesn't reflect the visible light spectrums, but you could just call it instead of high reflectance, the opposite of reflectance is emissivity. So if it's very low emissivity, it's highly reflective. And low emissivity or low E sounds expensive. And that's entirely why they call it low E glazing. But you have windows that are tuned for that and then they're tuned and built now so that they don't have a lot of conductive loss. So they have three layers, as many as three layers of glass. And then they put gases in there that don't conduct heat energy very well. And then now they're plowing lots and lots of research into the frames and insulating inside the frames and using much more uh, energy resistant products like fiberglass uh, for the frames instead of poly or the old aluminum and, and even wood. So the window technology is getting better for high energy efficiency. Your walls are going to be more insulated and then the envelope complete has to be very airtight. And that's the one that gets people going. You're building this super airtight home. Sounds unhealthy. And if you didn't bring fresh air in, <laughs> it would be tremendously unhealthy. Because we transpire, we, we put vapor into the environment. We're constantly emitting odors from our day-to-day -day activities, our garbage, our cooking, ourselves. And we're also putting carbon dioxide into the environment and other things coming out of upholstery and everything else. If you build it super tight, it very quickly becomes nasty and even toxic. <coughs> now the good news is we've learned that if we take fresh air from outside and the same amount of air that we got inside and just exchange it, Mother Nature does a great job of taking care of all this stuff. The trees scrub the carbon dioxide and the odors get eaten up and uh, turned back into particulate and good stuff and, and all of that. Mother Nature's really good at that stuff. And, and so it cleans that air all the time for us. So all we gotta do is bring fresh air in. But if it's minus five degrees outside and you bring that fresh air in, what's your furnace gotta do? Heat it. So there's a new tool that you also have heard about, I'm sure, and it's called an HRV or an ERV, but it's a heat recovery ventilator. And uh, all that does is it takes the air that you need to exhaust out and it passes it by the fresh air coming in, but it never mixes it. You know the corrugated cardboard? If you look at the edge and you can see the waffle pattern, you can see right through it. If you look at the other edge at 90 degrees, you can't see through it because the wafering <coughs> goes this way. Well, imagine if you took one piece of cardboard that way and another piece that way, you could blow air through this way and air through this way and the air would never mix, but think of all that surface area that's contacting. So a heat recovery ventilator is a very simple device that has stacks and stacks and stacks. Now they don't use cardboard, <laughs> but they use coroplast. Well, there's some aluminum ones in that, but they just, you know, the lawn signs that you see at election time and all that, the, it looks like corrugated cardboard, but it's, it's plastic. Those are the simple cores of HRV, and then they just stack and build a big cube of it, and all the air that they exhaust out goes through here, so it's only every other one seeing flow this direction, and then all the air coming in can only go through it this way, and so that stack has all of that surface area multiplied by all of those layers, and you can recover almost 80% of the heat energy in the, in the winter, or 80% of the cooling work that you did, so that you're pre-cooling the air coming in, and so your air conditioner doesn't have to cool it and you're preheating it when it comes in in the winter, so your furnace doesn't have to preheat 80% of that air. So you can see where the advantage to that is. Again, smaller and smaller um, 
um, uh, mechanical devices, yeah? What's the lifespan of the corrugated plastic? Because when it's exposed to air, it's not that good. Yeah, you can put filters, like HRVs are really nice, because once you're controlling the airflow, you can put all kinds of filters in there, you can take the organics out, you can take the odors out, you can take all of those things out. Key point here, though, is that's only for what the HRV can collect from your house and collect from outside. So if you build an envelope, going back to the air tightness, you got a bunch of leaks everywhere, all of that is exchanging air for you and improving your air quality, but you don't get the advantage of putting it through the heat recovery device. So to answer your question and expand on, on, on why we want to go to these HRVs, it's because we can't get energy efficiency without having a super tight envelope. Well, I guess I was we, thinking about other materials other than plastic. Well, they, they use in really expensive ones. You can get aluminum. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, but the key point is that core for those things is super cheap. It's just modified election signs, basically. They're a little skinnier than the election ones. But I built a model of that with my uncle in 1979 from a Mechanics Illustrated thing that talked about heat pumps. And we installed it in my cousin's cabin in Revelstoke. It's still operating up there with a couple of old furnace things. That, but the idea is every year you have to maintain your system. So that core can come out, and if it's in one of those recyclable or reusable or long-lived materials like aluminum, you can actually soak it, bleach it, clean it, blow it out, dry it, put it back in. Or if it's just these plastic ones, you can re and re. Now then you got to think about the bigger picture. I don't want to get into it today, but you know, yeah. what's your impact of plastics yeah. and what's your sensitivity to carbon? And trust me, that's all in the code now as of May 1st too. We have to account for the operational carbon in a house. So. Uh, the idea is by 2030, not only is it net zero for energy, but you're going to have to produce no carbon in heating and cooling your home. So again, that's where it's really problematic with natural gas. Question? So problem, we're in Lytton. Yes. And I come from Chilliwack. Right. And at this time of year, and for the next couple of months, smoke is going to be an issue. Yeah, and you so can, yeah, got, and that's I've the... got an HRV and a heat pump. Right. What I found was that if I keep the HRV running, I'll get the smoke coming in. And that in Lytton, and I've lived here, I know the smoke, right? And, uh, and then it gets that inversion that happens in here, and it just yeah. clings. Like everybody else cleans up, and it just the clings here. The heat pump itself, like the, I turned off the HRV, but the, the heat, heat pump, pump itself will filter the smoke. Well, it actually doesn't even connect because it doesn't have anything to do with the outside air coming in or the inside air going out. What connects the heat pump is actually a 3 8 inch copper line with refrigerant. So all of that air out there is just going around in your heat pump. Now you got to make sure that leaves and dust and all that stuff in yeah. those fins, so you want to maintain that. But you're right, running your heat pump for heating and cooling gives you none of that smoke infiltration. You can buy heat recovery ventilators that offer you dramatic banks of filters. So you can put carbon filters in and HEPA filters, and the HEPA will take out the hard particulates of smoke, and then the carbon will de-stink it. So in this neck of the woods, it really makes sense to put a high-quality heat recovery ventilation device in. Now, because your relative humidity loads are low here, most of BC, HRV or heat recovery ventilators is what you want to deal with. Some people are going to talk about energy recovery ventilators. That's for if you live in Florida or Toronto, anywhere where it's just dripping humid. Hawaii in the summer, Florida in the summer, Toronto in the summer. It's so humid out there. Remember I said about, you know, when you... You change liquid water to a vapor, you got to put energy in. So when you go from a vapor back down to a liquid, the same amount of energy comes out. Well, if it's super humid outside and you got to cool it when it comes in in the summertime, what, what are you doing? You're, you're taking that high energy condition of the vapor down to a low condition, so it, it pushes heat out. So it goes through your HRV, pre-cools the air coming in, except it doesn't. All that energy saving now just goes to making water, condensation. So your HRV is just pouring water out all summer and it's not tempering the temperature for you. But we don't have humidity in Lytton in the summer. There's a couple of shoulder seasons where you gotta watch for that stuff, but it, you know, at that point, it's a five, 10 degree difference inside nuts. So you really don't worry about the energy side. The heat pump can handle that very efficiently. So the answer here is don't overspend. Put your extra money, because the ERVs is a desiccant, they pull it out mechanically, there's another motor that has to spin that, there's another thing that has to be maintained. They're more expensive and less efficient. But they're much more efficient if you're in an environment that uses them. But for your purpose here, pretty much anywhere in BC, heat recovery ventilator, HRV is what you can look for. But it makes absolute sense to pay for the better quality heat recovery ventilating devices so that you can filter that air. And now you got air quality, 
You've got a building envelope that's got tremendous um, um, performance windows, tremendous performance opaque wall areas, separations to the ground and roofs. And you've got an air barrier that's absolutely airtight so that all of the stuff coming in and out goes through your heat recovery ventilator and then that house works tremendously efficiently. And we know how much ventilation we need and the beauty of ventilation for human occupancy is the thing that's the worst when we occupy our homes is moisture, humidity. And we are no longer comfortable as humans once we go above 60% RH. So the beauty of, you know, the, the, the design of a home with a super air, air, air source heat pump in there and everything else is that uh, it'll exchange air with the outdoor air and except for a couple of weeks out of the year, that exchanging of the air will the absolute humidity or the moisture that's in the air outside, when you bring it in and bring it up to temperature in the winter, the relative humidity goes down because warm air can hold more moisture in the vapor form. So when you bring that stuff in, it might be super moist outside when it rained, 90, 100% relative humidity, but maybe at 10 degrees. When you bring it inside and it warms up through the HRV and then through your heat pump, it's now 21 degrees and comfortable for you and I. The relative humidity of that now drops down below 60%. So that air has quality for ventilating your home. And if we vent enough to control humidity, we have enough to take care of carbon dioxide and all the other contaminants that release into our environment, unless you got radon gas problems where you're building or you've got an absurd amount of nastiness coming in because you bought furniture or carpet that's off-gassing chemicals and things. It can be challenged by those, and you can deal with those separately. But you know, to keep this simplified, what's the goal moving forward? Well, in the past, you could explore energy efficiency. And a lot of people went a little bit of the way. And even now, we're only going 20% improvement. Well, think about how much you spend for energy a year right now in your home. You know, I was talking to one gentleman here, and he's spending $1,200 a year. He's only in 580 square feet, and he does a lot of things to conserve energy. But what's a 20% reduction on $1,200? Or use two or $3,000 a year for energy as a, as a more reasonable estimate of what you would be using. What's 20% of $3,000 in a year? 600 bucks, that's one dinner out at the Ashcroft Manor, right? Without <laughs> factoring in the gas, right? I like it up there, but I've been there for a couple of decades. Is it still, uh, still there even? The, uh, the thing about uh, that 20% savings is what's it really doing for you? But if we go to net zero, where we're going to be in six, seven years, all designs are going to have to be there. By 2030, all of Canada, every home built has to be there. Um, what's um, an 80% reduction in your energy bill? 80% of 3000 is $2,400. How much more mortgage could you afford if you had an extra $2,400 a year that you weren't given to your utility? So what could that service? And so when a lot of people say, oh, it's going to cost more to build a net zero. I, you know, I can't afford houses at all right now. And if you listen to everybody, that's a common cry out there. I couldn't afford my house that I live in since 1999. Not a chance. So it's, it's really important that we understand that there is a premium to improve the energy efficiency, but you have to consider what does it bring back to you as a homeowner? I mean, at the end of the day, every month, if you have a mortgage and you have a utility bill, if you're paying zero to your utility bill, you got more to pay to a mortgage, it's the same amount of money coming from your cash flow, fixed income or otherwise. So where does that become interesting? Well, it becomes very interesting at net zero. The other thing that we found about net zero is because there's such a reduction in demand on energy, I mentioned it earlier, you got really tiny little furnaces. Like the heat pump, which does the heating and cooling on a 2,200 square foot demonstration project we built just um, at Cathedral Park, 3,000 feet of elevation, right against Cathedral Park uh, by Karameas on, on Highway 3 down there. Um, and it's got a very similar spec that we have here. It didn't get to 49.5 degrees there, but it got to 46 in the heat dome. We've had three years worth of data in there, and we're there during the heat dome, and our des winter design temperature there is minus 32. So it's a very similar range of operation in there. It would have normally taken a four and a half ton um, air conditioner, and a four and a half ton furnace to deal with that. That's a big furnace. That's a big air conditioner. We can do the whole thing on a one ton unit. And because it's a high efficiency unit, we put in a 1.2 ton unit. And with the low, uh, with the, uh, low temperature devices, you pay a little bit more money for them. But the advantage is the pump is a brushless pump technology. It's extremely efficient, low energy consumption. And your ability to bring hot in or push cold out is your ability to compress the refrigerant. 
So what happens is 98.5% of the time, it just operates as a uh, 14,000 BTU per square meter per year uh, heat pump for heating and cooling. And then for the one and a half percent of the time when it's wicked hot or the one and a half percent of the time when it's wicked cold, that screw just turns up and it becomes a 36,000 BTU heating and cooling device. But because it's such an efficient transition with the new pump technologies that we got in there, the actual operating uh, performance of that, that heat pump does not get sacrificed very much. And why, why heat pumps? Because for every unit of energy you put into a heat pump, you can get as many as three and a half or more units of heating or cooling into your house because you're not paying for the heat. You're just gathering it and putting it inside. You're not growing the apples, you're just carting them from outside to inside. Whereas a furnace, you're actually burning fuel in a conventional sense. Or with an electric furnace or a wallboard heat, you're turning them on and they're glowing and they, that turns into heat and then the air goes across it and that warms the, that up. So when you've got a wallboard heater, an electric furnace, or if you've got a gas furnace, you're going to be running in a range of 96 to 100 percent efficiency, no more. Heat pumps run at 350, 400 percent efficiency. So they're a fifth of the size of what you used to need and they're four times as efficient. So yes, electricity costs more than gas when you have gas in your community. You know, propane's really expensive to bring in bottles of that to use around here. But even in the lower mainland, it makes no sense to have anything on gas without even talking about the carbon issue about the, the gas. It's just electricity or all electric solutions just make tremendous sense. So you, you begin to see the capital cost in construction. Yes, the insulation costs more. Yes, the windows cost more. Yes, developing that level of air tightness requires changes in the way we build. But we've developed changes in architecture that allow us to give you the same look and the same function, but to give you this tremendous insulation and this massive level of air tightness with three or four layers, not one thing to do vapor diffusion control, the poly, and then sealing it all up for air tightness, and then putting insulation into a wall, and then framing a wall, and then sheathing it, and then putting another plane of protection on the side of that, and then putting a capillary break, and then putting the cladding out there. We can minimize all that stuff and use one material to do many things. And you're also increasing the life of the home from 99 years to 500 years. This is the key point that, that really shifts our thinking to applauding high energy efficiency. You're minimizing things like your mechanical, you're certainly minimizing your monthly operating costs as a homeowner, no matter what, if you've got a utility bill and then suddenly you don't, or you've got a dramatically reduced utility bill, um, that's an advantage to anybody. That's just money back in your pocket. So cost of ownership changes. But to that point, think about buildings built in the last 100 years. Under CAN CSA S478, which is the standard we use for determining, it's called Guidelines for Durability in Buildings in Canada. Under that, they openly declare by consensus that the houses we've built in Canada are intended to last 50 to 99 years. Uh, now think about it, right? You know, we're talking about your house built over 100 years ago. What was the foundation? Uh, just uh, sticks in rubble. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, would you do that now? You wouldn't even be allowed to do that now. But really, what, what was the durability? What was the real anticipated service life? It went through deep energy retrofits, so it had revived value. But the cost of deep energy retrofits is extraordinary. Very difficult to take an existing home and turn it into a high energy efficiency home. Much more cost effective to build a new one. So I don't want to minimize the massive heartache of having a fire that burns an entire community. But you're a, you have an opportunity right now, because you can't do deep energy retrofits on anything downtown. They're gone. But you have an opportunity to come out and take advantage of the fact that we can build super high energy efficiency, what they call net zero. If you put solar photovoltaic up, you could collect as much energy as you use year over year. That's what net zero means. Renewable energy is equaling the amount of energy you use in your home. Total energy, heating, cooling, ventilation, plugging in your computers, running your TVs, blenders, everything you use. And if you get to that net zero level, we're finding that because the elements are more expensive, but you're using really small versions of them, so they're quite cheap compared to what we're used to use. And because we're using more expensive materials and more of it, but we're getting much more um, performance out of those, and we can do two or three things with the insulation. We can make it the air barrier and the vapor barrier and the insulation, as opposed to having three different things that do those rules in, in the old buildings. So, um, Everybody asks how much. Well, 
I just had a big conference call with the CHBA and Natural Resources Canada, and they've developed a new software package, and they've done 100,000 iterations using the energy modeling software, and they've looked at the impact of this step code on costs, construction costs. So if your baseline is the way we built from 8, 1988 till now, the 936 base pro, your two by six wall with pink stuff in the walls, right? Double glazed window, nothing spectacular, a good old high efficiency gas furnace and an and 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 air conditioner unit in there if you're, if you're adding cooling. Uh, to go from that to go to step one, which was no improvement, you just engaged an energy advisor to tell you what you did and do a door fan test. So you get zero improvement on that. At step two, you get a 10% improvement on overall energy performance. And at step three, which is what we're at now, they actually jumped over one and two because it didn't make any sense. Communities could option to it, but it's going to become the minimum requirement. It has become as of May 1st this year. It's the minimum requirement is step three. That's a 20% overall improvement over the homes we were building up until May 1st. And again, that price impact on there, they're accounting that on a 2,800 square foot home to be in the range of about $55,000 to $75,000. Then when you go to step four, it goes from 20% to 40% better. You're not really at net zero yet, and that costs more again. But then when we built that demonstration project, which is why I built it with Karen and Mai's money, because that way we could do everything we did and we weren't getting tainted by anything, and and uh, we took all the risk and we got all of the, 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 we didn't have to come up with a result because whoever was paying for the study often want to get a certain result. Mm -hmm. Well, the result here was Karen didn't want to have a, a, a summer, we'll call it the cabin, but it's, it's an amazing house. She didn't want to have a house that when she went in and she turned on a light switch, it didn't turn on. She didn't want to have to winterize the pipes when every time we left. She wanted it, when you draw hot water for a bath, hot water comes out of the thing. And she doesn't want to go out and pull start a generator in the middle of the night because she's got no power. She wanted a pure experience, but we're 13 kilometers off grid there. We don't even have cell service there. So the idea is I built worst case scenario. And when we chose to build it, it was just at the beginning of COVID. Then we had the heat dome in 2021, and then we had all of the labor problems we had, and then we had a five-fold increase in the cost of building materials. There's no available talent <laughs> to build homes even where the builders are living in their community. How was I going to get somebody to travel an hour and 40 minutes each way per day to go do any of that work? Then the Fraser Valley got flooded. Then we couldn't even get to the work site. We had to go through Washington State to get there, and then all of the COVID restrictions on that made that a heck of a lot of fun. But at the end of the day, we had an independent um, quantity server look at the, the project. And we rebuilt that with all of the time and all the materials, the exact way we used it, and we transplanted it into five communities in British Columbia. It was Vancouver and Victoria and Prince George and Castledar and, and uh, Terrace. And, and so we, we, we modeled it, you know, for what the energy performance would have been and what we paid and everything <coughs> else like that. And for that building in the lower mainland, if we'd have built that in the lower mainland at its labor rates, it would have cost us $368 a square foot. Now, it's a pretty competitive rate in today's market. Mm -hmm. But we had most of our heavy purchasing done before all of that inflation on there. You're well over $400 a square foot now as a safe bet for a, for a house, not an architectural one of executive home, but a nice home, right? You're, you're, you're in the 400s <coughs> range. Uh, but what was interesting is we actually built it for $318 a square foot. Mm -hmm. So we built it for less with all of those amenities in there. Plus I got a sewage treatment plant in there. Plus we purify our own water on site. Plus we have solar collection because there's no energy collection in there. And we got a lot of real problems. The thing, whole thing's facing south because that's where the river is. Could you imagine riverfront property and then building it so that your house was like this to the river? So all of the glass and all of the beauty and the park and everything was exactly where the sun is all summer long. And I wanted a big hammer truss and a great room, so I could, if I wanted to shadow those glass windows from the heat in the summer, I would have needed 46-foot overhangs for my roofs. <laughs> so we used building science, and we improved the quality of the window and the performance of the window, and we put triple glazing in there, and we put massive solar rejection, so it's highly reflective, very low emissivity coated windows on there. And so we lose the free heat in the wintertime, but the mountain is in our way, so... Not only do we overheat in the summer, but then in the winter when the sun sweeps lower, we don't get any of the free heat. So it was the worst possible condition to build in. 
And we were actually able to build it net zero for cheaper than we would have been able to build that if we had just done the same house there with two by six walls and a bunch of pink insulation. So, question? Yeah, I'm just, just interested on the type of envelope that you use. On that. You know what, I'm going to invite you to come by the booth where I am. I'm here all day. I can show you exactly the kind of envelope that we used. But it's all perfect wall technology. It's all exteriorly insulated. So, in fact, we went back to a two by four. for, I mean, it's not even a structural two by four wall. We did it with heavy timber, and then we just infilled with balloon frame two by four walls, which are empty. And then the sheathing is on the outside, and we beefed up the spec on that so we don't have to go fishing for structure. So it's three quarter inch stuff that's for plywood, and we put a vapor bay. Anyway, I can explain all that, but all the insulation is on the outside. Now, that's not the only way you can do it. You can do it with thick walls, right? You can do it with uh, mass wall constructions like uh, blocks. You see some examples of, of that stuff in on the floor in here. I'm not saying one way or the other is better or worse. You have to look at the specific merits of each one. And each one also has to work in your environment. Like some things will work in a mild climate, but you take them up north, and suddenly you've got mold and mildew growing inside that wall because it's just such a severe winter. Question in the back of my cell window here, too. I, think that was yeah. first. I was just going to ask, Murray, um, I, don't, I don't mean to take you back, but I really uh, appreciated what you were saying about HRVs. Um, what are your thoughts on as you know buildings become more and more airtight and with good reason mm -hmm. um, on whether or not an hrv is something that should be deemed an essential load that needs to be kept powered during a grid outage what it, it actually mm. <laughs> okay so that that's, that's a valid question let me tell you i sit on the codes committee for canada and bc and, yeah trust me i have a learning disability so to compensate for my dyslexia i can't read with any kind of veracity I have to read each word, then unscramble the sentence, and then I have to commit that sentence to my memory so I can then do it to the next sentence, and I have to put them together. And I just can't understand why people take a holiday and go read books. Like, it's exhaustive for me. <laughs> However, I honestly, you know, when they you see it on TV and they show the page doing that, and you tunnel, and you... If a book really grabs my attention, then suddenly I find myself reading like a normal person and I forget the enjoyment and then as soon as I think about it, I'm lost and I can't get back into the zone, right? Yeah. So, but the result of that is anything that I read, I read and I have ridiculous accurate retention of it because it takes me so long to figure it out. And so when a word is not making sense and so my entire career has evolved into reading and writing reports and reviewing the code and looking at code language and finding its flaws and everything else. So to answer your question, what the code says, and I say with some authority here, <laughs> it says you must have, under 932 for small structures, you must have continuous ventilation at the preset rates based on the occupancy of the home. And the occupancy is determined by the number of bedrooms, and it assumes there's two people in the first one and one for each bedroom after that. So that fixes the rate of air out, air in. And once you have that, it's determined that that's a safe level for a normally occupied home. Now, what could screw that up? Power outage, right? So that's one thing that we've got to talk about. What else could screw that up? What happens at Christmas to your three-bedroom home? And you got eight people in there and a wet dog, right? Because they always bring their Labrador. And the Labrador is always swimming, breaking through the ice to do it, right? So now what's your ventilation rate? It's non-responsive. So, and yeah. And uh, what else could mess up that ventilation in there? Well, clogged filters and any number of things. Poor maintenance, that's another thing, right? So it's not a set and forget thing, you got maintenance. So your HRV, I am impressed. It's extremely important that you maintain those systems, which is hard to do if somebody puts them in backwards and the thing, the door you gotta open is up against your basement wall, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't have, <laughs> City of Vancouver went to mandatory HRVs several years ago and they didn't put anything in there about due diligence on how you installed them. And that's exactly what they did. They were putting them in garages. Like now your device is up the condition. Oh, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> so let's deal with your question. What happens when you have a power outage or a sustained power outage? What's going on with the ventilation in your home? So in the 1900s, your original home, you didn't care, right? Because the air leakage in there was somewhere measured with a door fan. The total volume of the air, if you pressurize the home to 50 pascals, which is not a huge pressure difference, like 300 pascals can raise a column of water one inch. So it's one sixth of an inch of vacuum raising a, a column of water. So it's not a huge pressure differential, but they measure the volume of air per hour, the, the amount of air changes of the total volume in your house that changes measured at 50 pascals, they call it ACH 50. 
So when you do this Dorfan test, it's the metric that they go by. So, you know, in the old days, um, 1900s in that, 12, 13 air changes per hour at that forced ventilation rate. It was a, it was a sort of a standard number. CMHC's got huge research and archives on that because they did all of the, the energy programs for updating your houses. So in order to do that, you had to have energy advisors come in and do door fan tests. So there's lots of data. We get that. And then we went through about World War II, end of World War II. Things tightened down to about 9 or 10 air changes an hour. And then in the 70s, we started seeing recognition that it wasn't just a vapor barrier needed in your wall, you needed something to be airtight as well. In the old days, you had that black paper with the beige face stapled on the insulation. It was very good at retarding vapor movement by diffusion, but air could just pass through there, it would just filter the dust out of it as it went through the insulation. So in the 70s, they began this notion of including a concept of airtightness in the envelope because they were making it mandatory that you had two by four walls with bad insulation in them and some of them were starting to fail in the old days. They didn't fail because if you do a thermographic scan of a 1910 home in the winter, what do you see flowing out of every orifice in that house? What is just heat pouring out of it because there's no insulation in there. Well, how's that going to grow mold or mildew? Everything in there is like a hairdryer blowing through your walls and heating everything up. So, you know, it's kind of like when you got a boat, right, and you're coming into the harbor and it's high tide. Who cares, right? But when it's low tide, you're a little worried about the rocks and hidden treasures down there. They're going to rip your hull apart. Well, in the old days, we built houses where we didn't care how we built them because they worked by accident. As you get closer and closer to net zero, all that treacherous water underneath you is going to get at your hull unless you know how to go around it or build a hull that can handle those contacts. And that's the downside of high energy efficiency. But to hold on to this concept, when did things change? Well, in the 70s, we were averaging about six and a half or seven air changes an hour. And then in the 80s, do you remember what happened when we went to two by six walls? They also drilled holes in Well, that's, that never was in code. That was just stupid, the vapor diffusion port. We haven't got time for that. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what, they, what did they make us put on the inside before you put the drywall on? Like in the 70s, it was just two mil polyvapped on there. But then what did you, what happened in the 80s, in the mid 80s in the code? Six mil poly, and what do you have to do to all the edges? Seal it, tape it, or, in, or, or acoustic seal it, non carrying butyl. What generation of four story wood frame condos was the first generation of condos that were subject to leaky condo? From the 80s? 80s. Anything built under that new code provision with two by six walls and R20 bat insulation, and that's sealed poly bag in there because you'd reduced energy flow through convection through the air barrier you'd reduced energy flow by conduction by going from a two by four to a two by six wall so you went from effective conductive resistance of eight to effective 16 it was rounded off by 0.4 but so you doubled the amount of conductive resistance you dramatically improved the air tightness you're down now around six air changes an hour and now to get back to your heat recovery ventilator question it turns out that once you're tighter than seven air changes an hour measured at 50 pascals, the accidental ventilation with all those holes in that building envelope for your 1900 home or your 1950s home was not enough to keep it safe inside. So we didn't care in 1972 or 1981 or Expo 86 even, but in 88, all of a sudden we we're building houses that had to have mechanical ventilation. And then do you remember what they first put in there to control how often it went on? Remember those little humidistat dials that were on all the walls? Hands up, how many of you are on the bathroom fan? The really noisy bathroom fan that you yeah. couldn't sleep with? How many people learned really quickly that if you turn that number high enough, <laughs> it will go out, right? So you weren't bending your house, but that number on there was zero to 100. Remember what I told you? Comfort and safety maxes out at 60%. The minute you turn that dial above 60, so it would only go on at humidity above 60, you had a toxic environment. So then the code said, well, nice try, but we can't give people control because they don't get it. Which is still unfortunate because I like positive controls, but fail safe is also good, right? So we're still trying to answer your question. What do you do in a power route? Well, I the know, first, I, I know you'll get there. You know, the first, <laughs> the first issue is should we care? And the, the answer to that is what I just went through. Damn straight, because if you're going to build now to step three, anybody know what your ACH 50 has to be? That's step three? 3.5 maybe? 2.5. 2.5. Oh, okay. Right? 3.5 is what you had to do for step two, but nobody built it step two. Well, unless your municipality was asking for it. They had an option to go there. Your authority having jurisdiction is the big, big word for it. 
your counts. <laughs> so um, you're billing at 2.5, is that under seven? Yep. So do you need ventilation? Yeah. So when there's a power out and you're driving your ventilation through the continuous operation of your HRV, what's happening? Well, you're in trouble unless somebody opens a window. What if you can't open a window? Well, then you're in trouble. Then, well, yeah, it makes ventilation very difficult. And who's, you know, has anybody got an alarm that measures relative humidity inside your home and when it goes over 60%, you wake up at two in the morning, go and open a window, yeah. right? What about your air barrier? How many people? Has this ever happened in the history of mankind? Where two guys get together and they say, we should go to the Lytton pub. I can't now, but we should go to the Lytton pub. And that one guy says to the other guy, no, not today. I've got to maintain my air barrier. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as we move to this future where we're going to embrace high energy efficiency, and I hate to tell you, at two and a half, which is now the legal requirement, you got to vent that house. The big question is, what are you doing to ensure operational conditions within that home? There's two answers to this. You can own your own home. You can buy a simple little RH device or put, you know, in the age of technology we've got now, I have a weather station on every building that I own or have ownership of, and I can see it online. And whenever it goes to 60%, the thing beeps in. Yep. And then my iPhone tells me that there's something going on in there, and technically it's 55%. But when you live in the wet coast, right by the ocean, there's about three weeks a year in the spring and the summer where you can't actually use the outside air and maintain that. So in classic government fashion, it's supposed to be 27 to 55% is human comfort under hash rate. And that doesn't work because you can't guarantee that you can maintain it unless you put dehumidifiers in. And uh, they didn't want to get into that because there's another two grand for everybody. And, and they make noise and you got to remember to empty them or you got to plumb them. And then when you don't plumb them right, they back up and then you get a flood and then you're Insurance tells you you should have known better and buy, you know, yeah, okay. So what do the government do? They can't change the physics. They can't change the fact that that air doesn't have good enough quality around Halloween and in the spring when you're going on those shoulder seasons. So they just decided that they would round the numbers, 27 rounds to 30 and 55 rounds up to 60 and you can maintain 30 to 60. But I'm telling you right now, if you want to be a purist, at 55, we want to be doing something about it. And it will affect all kinds of things. It'll affect your wood when you get above 55% relative humidity to begin to swell. And then it'll dry out in your dry season when it gets cold in the winter. Because that air outside is devoid of a bunch of moisture. When it's snowing outside, there's not a lot of humidity out there. And when it gets really cold, like in the prairies, and you see all that glistening, that's actually humidity uh, turning into frozen ice. It never actually turns into a liquid. It actually drops two phases in one, in one shot, right? And you get those weird halos on... Saskatoon high rise, uh, skyline in the morning and it's like building science is fun but the reality of it is is that there's a couple three weeks in the most extreme conditions in Canada where you got to watch out for it but it's not enough to kill the house right it, it, the houses particularly with wood framing and absorptive materials in the structure have the ability to take a bunch of water in the bad times out of the air and store it in the stuffing of your couches and your carpets or your rugs or your clothes or your closets or your towels or anything else in there and in the building materials itself in your studs and the sheathing they can moist the moisture can can go you know they want to hold at about 10 percent moisture content in the wood but it'll go all the way up to 19 percent moisture content without being a problem so how dry does wood have to be by building code before you can close it up I just see a couple of code nerds giving me the 2.5 out there. <laughs> you can't close up any wood in construction until it's 19% or drier. Why is that? Because nothing that can digest or create mold or mildew or any of the nastiness that we're trying to protect against exists in organic materials that are less than 19% moisture content, 19 or less. So it seems like an arbitrary number, but that's why it's there. Mm -hmm. And, and Litton Lumber was a master. They didn't have to run a kiln. They eventually built one because the code gen got a bunch of money for making electricity out of it, but they air dried here. And it was tremendous. So if we could air dry lumber in Lytton 12 months out of the year, I'm pretty damn sure you're not gonna have to be worrying about popping above 60%. So to answer your question, probably not gonna be earth changing, but if it was gonna go on for a second or a third day, open your windows. Yep. And just have something that monitors it. You know, two bucks. I think if you go to Canadian Tire twice in a week, they give you one for free, like little, yeah. If your power goes out and you're running on a heat pump, could you have, do you recommend one of those Tesla battery kind of things that switch on 
your power goes out? Well, you ever, yeah, this is a great question. Yeah. Like, wait, okay, so renewable energies. I'll be talking about that in the next hour. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> can I, can I, can I, I'm going to give you a real, I want to give you a real high, inter, high level introduction, and I've got two minutes left, so. Yeah. Don't, don't feel rushed. But I want to give you a real high level answer to that, because it's a tremendous question. As British Columbians, this is not the same game around the world. Like, for example, in Ontario, if you put solar photovoltaic on your roof, the utility would give you a contract and would buy as much power as you could sell to them under contract. In the first contracts over there, we're pushing 80 cents a kilowatt hour. Now you're buying your power in now at about 13.8 cents a kilowatt hour, taxes in and all that, right? So why wouldn't you put as many photovoltaic panels as you could up on your roof and use that as your job? Right? And Germany began that feed-in tariffs, they're called. They have absolutely no... Why were they doing that, though? Because they needed to disengage from coal. Mm -hmm. Ontario, all coal-fired. Well, predominantly. Alberta, predominantly uh, coal-fired. Germany, all of Germany, predominantly coal-fired. Well, they've taken their nuclear out. But when you go into Berlin, you, know, you go by hectares. All the old Russian armed forces bases back in the day where the wall was up, the Germans kind of looked at all that and said, I'm not sure we really want to dig into the ground over there where the Russians were for the last four decades. So they're just hectares and hectares and hectares of solar photovoltaic panels. And they're powering much of it off of the roofs and the backyards and the fields and the public grounds off of photovoltaic. And this is the way they're dramatically reducing and making their commitments to the world about carbon reduction is off of this. And then people say, well, that's fine, but we're in British Columbia, we're way too far north. Those fields are Berlin, right? Get a globe and go across from Berlin to British Columbia. Guess what city you go through? Cornell. Prince George. Yeah. yeah, and it actually turns out that even the worst locations in BC have better solar effectiveness than Germany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, is, is it worthwhile looking for solar? Absolutely. What's happening to the cost of solar? Well, to put a good 10 kilowatt system up on your roof, which is a pretty healthy system, Right, you're probably looking at twenty-five to thirty-five thousand bucks in that range. You're it's, paying too much. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. but you got to have some. You, first of all, you got to prove that your roofs are solar ready. Then you got to make the amendments to your truss or have an engineer come in there and certify that they're solar ready. Are you stealing all my funds? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm just saying, if you got twenty-five or thirty-five thousand dollars, you can put a ten k system up now. I'm telling you, it'd be way less than thirty-five. Yeah, yeah, and it would. But, and, and I'm, I want to hear where you're going on there, but I'm just saying it's not going to be more than that, not nowadays. But then you have two choices of what you do with that power. One is you make the connection and you grid tie. So your meters are all non-net meters in British Columbia. So not only can they read them from afar, but they work forward and backward. So every time you're making power, but you're, you know, down in Mexico for the winter or whatever you're doing, you're just pumping it up and it goes up into the grid through that meter and it runs it backwards and so BC or whoever your utility is knows how much kilowatt hours you've you've dumped up to them and they buy it from you for eight cents a kilowatt hour <laughs> and then when you need it because it is a one for one exchange they don't pay it today yeah well now yeah they, abs they absolutely do so you, you you all need to listen to my first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you if you give them a kilowatt hour and then you take a kilowatt hour back, but if you just upload it, like grid it to them, yeah. So more later. But does it make sense to hook up to solar photovoltaic? Well, you can grid tie. That's a very nice way of using the grid instead of batteries to store the energy because you may not need it in two in the afternoon when you're not there. But somebody's going to need it in British Columbia, yeah? so. It goes into the grid and it gets used, and then they can adjust how much they're dropping through the dams and the and the big turbines that are making the electricity. They instantaneously adjust for the demand loads in British Columbia. Well, if they're getting it already in the grid, the grid's demand load on the dams goes down and it saves the water behind it as potential energy and blah, blah, blah. The plan two is you can put batteries in your house and you can store it. We are completely off grid up there. I have the Elon Musk satellite, and then I also have an Explorer Net because we do live presentations from there. And I never want one satellite to go down because my clients don't appreciate it when I'm lecturing and I'm not lecturing anymore, right? <laughs> so we have two sol uh, satellite connections up there. We have solar photovoltaic. We got some really cool arrays up there, but I want you to go on to all that stuff. 
And then uh, we collect all that solar energy and we put it into 50 kilowatt hours worth of storage. And so that house with everything in it, I only have, it's designed for 25 kilowatt hours a day. So I have two days worth of power with no injection in there. And then I have a diesel backup generator in case the winter time with the shadowing and, and all of that causes me to go over that. But then I buried that all in an insulated cube. So all the heat that comes off of inversion and charging and the diesel generator if it turns on, I collect it with a radiator and I put it into a thousand liter water reuse thing because we produce, we, we process our own sewage on a thousand liters a, a day. So I've got this big container of water that's all purified from my sewage treatment plant. It goes back in and that's the water that goes into the toilets and the laundry. So it just goes around and around and around. So I take all the heat that comes off of everything that's releasing heat, put it in the water, and then my HRV actually has a geo-exchange loop, which is a heat pump, but it's water, air or water. It goes into that thing, and, and for the winter time, when I don't have very, as much solar potential for my heat pump to bump up to its maximum capacity, my HRV still has to run. But it just goes and it grabs that heat that's in that thousand liters of water, and 30% of my cold day energy comes from that hot water, which is recovered energy or cogen energy off of a diesel generator. And so you get it, like there's crazy options that you can play with, but in its simplest term, batteries, an inverter charger unit, solar panels. This brings it in and it charges or it direct drives or both. And then uh, you've got the energy there that you've collected and you use that energy. And because your house is so miserly on its energy consumption, because you've got this great heat pump technology and this incredible building envelope and these wonderful windows, you know, rounding it all out and this phenomenal air tightness, it's extremely healthy. It's extremely cost effective to build and it's extremely cost effective to own. And what happens to the durability of the house? Well, the way we built it, with everything on the outside, what can rot? Like if I gave you all a piece of two by four today as a going away present, and I asked you all to put it under the bed you sleep in every night for the rest of your life, and then bequeath it to whoever is in you're bequeathing it to, and have them do it, how many generations before that two by four rots? If it lives under the bed you sleep in every night. Have you calculated this? Yeah. Is there a right answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to suggest 1,000 years? 10,000 years? Like you got 1,000 year old structures with heavy timber in Europe that are inside. They're fine. Sure. sure. Right. 1,000 years. I vote for that. Yeah. yeah. So if all of the stuff that you got outside is doing the air tightness and the vapor diffusion control and the insulation and it's all built, don't shoot me here, but of very, very robust materials bitumens and, and plastics and things. What's the one thing that we hate about those things? They don't break down, right? But if you don't want them to break down, <laughs> so what happens if you do that and then you include those materials that are highly recyclable at end of life? So if you use EPS, popcorn polystyrene, or we, we really like the GPS, it's got some graphite in it, bumps it up to, to even greater levels of insulation per unit thickness. Um, that stuff is basically, once you've made that insulation once, it'll be good for a thousand years. And then when you take the house down, they actually put it into steam and in BC it's generated from hydroelectric uh, heat sources. They just melt it down, put it back into the polystyrene beads, and then they steam them back up and then it's good for another thousand years. And it's a zero carbon process. So it's got a zero operational and a zero embodied carbon. And if it's in a house that lasts a thousand years instead of a hundred years, it divides any penalty for the fact that it came from an oil derrick to begin with over 10 times the service life. So it really becomes very minuscule on the badness for Mother, mother Nature out there. So it's a complex question. It's a complex thing. But what people are not paying enough attention to is that if you go back at net zero and you get it right, remember, you're in the harbor at low tide. So if you don't get it right, you're going to wreck the hull and the house is a throwaway. Right? But if you do get it right, that house will makes sense for your daughter, your daughter's daughter, your daughter's daughter's daughter, and your daughter's daughter's daughter. By, com by comparison, if you build a house today, even at step two or three, three is the minimum they have to have 20% improvement, what's its durability? Well, if you just build it with R22 bat instead of R20, you're building the same thing. The building science is the same. It's good for 15 to 99 years. So you give that house to your kid after you've done 30 or 40 years in it, and all you've given them is a $250,000 liability to take it down and a construction 
project at fair market value. So it's going to cost them more than to build a house on, on green space development land. And they're going to have to do this every two generations, whereas if it lasts a thousand and it's renewable, you build it so that you can put the windows in and out and you can put heat pumps in and out and, and the things that wear out are renewable instead of trapped in there and not, not able to renew them. Um, suddenly you're talking about cost of ownership going way, way down, way, way, way down because and then the fact that we can build them at or even less than what we're building houses for right now, and we can answer to the carbon equation, and we can take control of renewable energies, as long as we make good decisions and consider all of those inputs, that's the key to success. Now that house that we built down there is in a zone six, so it's the same as Prince George, right? That thing, you know, you hear about the R value. What's people's sense of what R value you need to be net zero in a wall? Like we're currently building at R16 with R20 bat. You know, you hear people talking about R60 walls, R100 attics. You should be able to get there with about somewhere between R40 and R50. Don't even need it in the walls. Yeah. I'm 32 and I can't justify another there you go. one on it. Yeah. And I'm in, I'm in zone six. I'll, I'll bet you your floor slabs are heavily insulated. So underneath? Yeah. Not, that not too bad. Yeah. So we built and modeled several houses that are net zero with traditional 2x6, 24 inch on center, R22 baths or R24. Are right. you saying that like this net zero house is going to last for a thousand years? No, it won't net because it's a stuff wall. Well, and another wall that's like, if you're just saying net zero, like why is one better than the other? Well, net zero, but it depends on how you get there. Uh -huh. Right? I mean, we talk about a stuff wall. I mean, and I don't want to say that it's a wrong technology. It just doesn't have the same durability in the long run. And that may or may not be important to you. Didn't but, you didn't say that a 2 by 4 underneath the bed will last for But it's not insulated. It's only structure. All of the, the control for rainwater, vapor, everything else happens on the outside of the sheeting out. And it's all roofing membranes and plastic insulations and fiberglass clips and cladding. So everything that is controlling your environmental loads is outside. So that piece of plywood and your studs are exactly in the same environment for their entire life as that piece of two by four that I handed out to you. When you stuff a wall, what's the temperature on the inside of the exterior sheathing in the winter? All your insulation's in here. So what temperature is this at? Sorry, inside of the wall? No, on the outside of the wall. The one that's holding the cladding on on the outside. It's very close to the same as the outside temperature. So if you've got warm moisture laden air or relative humidity conditions that rise inside that wall and they see that cold surface, what do they do to it? They condense on it. Whereas a wall that's got everything to the outside, what's the temperature of the sheathing and the studs all year long? And because I don't have vapor barriers and air barriers or anything else, what's its humidity environment? We're controlling the inside for human occupancy and it's just an extension of that space. So it's living at 27 to 60% relative humidity. It'll never hydrically wet to a point where it can decay. It actually works in the perfect zone for structural stability and normalized and everything else. I'm interested to know your opinion. So we build structural sets of sets. Right. Uh, with EPS and steel skins, 26 gauge. Uh, EPS? Cores. Cores. So yeah. So six, eight. Well, it's pretty standard six pound, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, which is a steel steel set instead of wood or MGO board or something of that nature. Just kind right. of interested to know your opinion on, on those. Because the air tightness, we've never had an issue with, with that with that test yes. um, at all. Yeah, the problem we've had with SIPs is not too airtight. Mm, well, no, it's not too airtight. <laughs> the problem is that if it isn't perfectly airtight yep. at the seams and you're in a cold enough environment, it just uh, eats them alive. Like none of the SIPS experiments have been very successful in the Arctic, for example. Steel SIP. The SIPS construction itself, they all rot at the at the seams. Yes. Just from very, very tiny amounts of vapor Moisture. movement through air leakage. Because there's very little air leakage, but it's all at those joints. So we, we seal with sealant and then we also 3 on the tip every seam. Absolutely. And the, all these things are necessary. Now that you've got vapor permeable tapes that you can use on the outside, these are all things that you can do. And in that instance, yeah, but at the end of the day, your outer skin is OSB. And OSB hydraulically wets at 80% relative humidity, so it is prone to mold and mildew. It's much more sensitive to it. It doesn't have to actually saturate. Right. It, it, you need to, it can actually wet up enough to, 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 
to support the growth of molds and mildews, even at 80% relative well, so you're yields. recommending a, uh, arguably a liquid applied, presumably a liquid applied. No, no, just get it, if you, okay. The well, colder, like the, edges of the colder the, your design uh, condition is, so we got zone in BC here, we've got zone four, five, six, seven A, seven B, and then we have one tiny little blip of zone eight in Northern British Columbia. I forget the name of the community, but it's the only Fort one that's Nelson. got, in, what is it? Fort Nelson? No, 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 Fort Nelson's still seven B. There's one there that's eight, but it only had one building on it. It was a government building and burned down in the seventies. So if anybody goes to build there, you actually have a zone eight condition. But that's crazy, that's like 9,000 heating degree days. That's winter. But when you go up into the Yukon and the NWT and you're building an old crow or you're somewhere on Baffin Island or something like that, you've got to really worry about, and, and ultimately most people have abandoned SIPs in, in the far north because it's sensitive to even the tiniest amount. By comparison, you know, when you're dealing in zone four and five and six, mm -hmm. I've seen very good success using SIPs panels. But they, they operate with persist walls up in the north still, which is, I, you can't tell me that that's a better wall system. Right? No, Do it's they, terrible. Well, are you kidding? They're selling the First Nations, they're selling sea cans. Yeah. And they're insulating them on the wrong side. The vapor control and everything's on the outside, and you got a seven foot ceiling height. I'm There's, just wondering how you mitigate that seam piece, right? Yeah, you know, the, how you mitigate it is go to perfect wall technology. So you put the membrane all over everything, yeah. and then you put all your rest of your control layers to the outside, which is not SIPS friendly. This is exteriorly insulated using rigid. So it's all the materials in a SIPS but you're putting all the structure and sensitive materials inside and all of the, the control layers to the outside. So they call this perfect wall. And in roofing, they call it IRMA or an inverted roof. So what you do is you put your roof membrane down with nothing in the attic or anything. So it's an air barrier, it's a vapor barrier, it's a roof membrane, and you put all your insulation on top of that. You'll hear this referred to as an inverted roof because we're used to putting insulation and everything and then venting the attic space and then putting everything on top. I sure they call them a flat commercial roof, so it's a strategy of the insulation. Is on top yeah, oh, oh yeah, but you can do it on slope roofs too. Like, like the project that we built in, the demonstration project, and again, come by and I'll show you pictures of it. It's three by six tongue groove Douglas fir on a 1012 pitch roof. And that is the minor structure between all the heavy timber bents. Like each one of the frames every 12 feet, those span that. And then on top of that, we got one vapor permeable, absolutely consistent peel and stick membrane on there. So we've got stick VP and Henry's on there, so VP 100. Um, both worked extremely well. And uh, the reason we put those on there is because we wanted to have a membrane notwithstanding before we get to the wood. And the reason we put vapor permeable on there is because if it defeats all the other layers and we get a little bit of water under the insulation on top of that membrane, it'll just drive by vapor drive through the membrane and Douglas fir becomes extremely breathable when you have high humidity, so it just breathes in. So now our roof is all that insulation on top of the membrane and then a gap with a roof, a traditional roofing felt underneath it, and then a gap, and then the roofing material on top of that. So any water has to beat the roof. It has to beat the roof felt. Then it has to beat the two pound foam, which is one monolithic layer of closed cell plastic that's eight inches deep. And then even if it gets through all of those layers, then there's a full roofing membrane underneath that. And then even if it defeats that, it's gonna drip on your head. It's not gonna get hung up on that poly bag in your ceiling or anything, and you're gonna see a stain exactly where that is. So there's actually seven lines of defense and a traditional roof has two. Mm -hmm. And then the other problem is if you insulate your ceiling and not your roof deck, you can vent your attic space. People think you have to vent that. The code says vent it or don't. If you vent it, one in 300 for slope, one in 150, effective cross ventilation, blah, 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 right? It's all these things that everybody goes through in those attics. But if you, back to 1948 when the first code was put together here in Canada by Kirby Garden, the reason you vent your attics is because in the old days we did, had, did nothing for air tightness in those ceilings. We put bugger all for insulation in there. So what was coming through the ceiling and hitting the underside of your roof deck? Vapor, but also heat. So what happened to the snow when the heat hit the underside of your roof deck? It would melt. But how much heat loss on the overhangs, your eaves, where the roof goes out past your walls? No heat loss, so it would freeze out there, and that's where your icicles ice come dam. from. And it'll ice dam, it'll back the water up, and everything goes to heck. Go to Nelson, right? They got eave heaters, coils, everything monstered on there, and the people pound tin on there trying to get rid of the ice damming on their old houses. And yeah, it's uh, Nelson's cool because they built it up from the lake upwards, so it's just like a 
of, of housing history encyclopedia because the oldest houses are by the water. They're old Victorian 19, 1900 built and the newest ones are at the top. Go up there, that's where the really entertaining stupid stuff happens. It is the drug capital for a reason. That is the one we call it the Dr. Seuss house. All the windows are crooked. It's like, really? So, uh, you know, as, as we look at all of this stuff and then we look at a conventional vented attic and we realize that the only reason that we actually did it originally was so we could take care of ice damming. Well, nowadays you need what kind of insulation, what kind of air tightness? Massive. And it has to be perfect to get to these nets. So how much heat loss and vapor are you going to get up in the attic space? None. So do you really need it to be vented? No. But here's the downside now. Remember the going into bay at high tide versus going in at low tide? What happens with the air outside on Halloween? I don't care where you are, even here. You take the kids out, what rolls in as the sun goes down? Fog. Fog, Fog tells you that the relative humidity outside is what? 100. Because it's condensing on the fine particulate in the air. And when lumber was down here, you had lots of fine organic condensating nuclei from coming out of the stack of the beehive, right? So as soon as the, they cool down to the dew point condition, which is the same as ambient temperature outside at 100% relative humidity, it condenses on the outside of each one of those dust particles, and that's what fog is. You ever looked at it, and it kind of looks like there's little tiny droplets? The fog and clouds are liquid water in tiny little droplets, and inside each one of them is a dust particle. And that's why when it rains on your brand new fresh washed car, and then the rain dries up, what's all over your car? Yes. Condensating nuclei, right? That's where it comes from. So. If it's 100% relative humidity outside, and you got perfection in air tightness and insulation to make a net zero home, and you encourage that air to come up into that attic space over top of all of that in there, then what is the moisture content of the air up against the underside of your roof deck? 100% 100 relative humidity. But this is where the tide going out is a problem. It's always happened, but it never mattered. That roof is pointed up into outer space all night long. So it becomes a radiant heat transmitter, even if it's the roof deck's at minus five. It doesn't matter, it's 268 degrees Kelvin, and it's looking out into the night sky. So just like the sun radiates heat to us, what is your roof doing with that heat all night long? Radiating it in the infrared, and we know that, and you've all seen it, they fly a helicopter overnight and you can see all the roof decks. Well, because it's radiating out and you can't create or destroy heat, and the heat's just coming from the heat that's trapped in the shingles and in the, in the sheathing of your roof, it's like emptying the battery. So what happens to the temperature of the roof deck? It goes down about three degrees at night. But the air underneath there is 100% relative humidity at three degrees warmer. So it's what happens when you pull the cold bottle of pop out of a fridge? Condensation wood condenses on the inner side of your roof sheathing. And that's what creates all of those strips of mildew and mold on roofs as you get more and more energy efficient. So by the time you get to net zero, actually venting your attic is the worst thing you can do. And the best thing you can do is insulate your roof deck. And then people say, oh, all that extra volume, you've got to heat and cool. It's not. The heat loss is relative to the area of your building envelope. So take your ceiling and open the drawbridge. How much more area do you really have of roof when you slope it? It doesn't matter about the volume. You've already added that little tiny bit of ridge line on there. So you're not really paying a penalty in that you have more building envelope to lose heat on. But what you're doing is you're allowing it now so that your building envelope is up there, and if you do it right, you put the roof membrane on and nothing inside, and you condition that space like it's another room. Very little energy penalty. And now what can you put up in the attic? Everything. Where did, you, where did we put furnaces, and if you got an HRV, or where do you put them now? And think about the evolution of that. 1900s, we go around Old Shaughnessy and that, the whole basement was devoted to, what were those little, doors that were angled like that at the side of basements in 1900. Yeah. That's where the coal went. And how big was that coal boiler down in there? So why did they build basements? For the furnace. And then we started getting better and better, and we started using oil, and then we started using natural gas, and we got more efficiency in there. So, But you still need a furnace room. This stuff, mechanically, if you put it up in the attic space, you don't need that anymore. So the, now the question is, do you even need to dig a basement? Can you just build it on piles and elevate your house like we did in the 70s? I'm seeing a couple of hands, and I'm seeing some people have reached their building science maximum. <laughs> your, your time is up. Yeah. There, there's somebody's must be going, and I think people are. Yep. Are showing you yep. So I want to I want to hand this over to the conversation in there, just to summarize. 
you know, we, we can't be afraid of going to, to net zero, but you have to do it right. And in order to do it right, you have to understand the building science. It's not just about the energy calculations. It's about what's potentially going to get triggered when you lower the water in the bay. And that's the, that's the, the package that we need to pay attention to. We've got lots of tools here in British Columbia. We're the masters of it. And now let's look at one of the really important things. That's renewable energy, if you want Thanks, to jump on that. That was really good. Thank you. Thank you.